invite you to worship with us.
till I met you. I was breathing but not alive. All my failures I tried to hide. It was my turn till I met you. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glorious day. You called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. my eyes in a 
that happen that we feel let down about. Has anyone else felt left out or left let down this week? It happens. And the scripture says it rains on the just and the unjust, but everyone experiences difficulty in life. Everyone is gonna feel that. But what we are saying 
is that God isn't gonna let us down. His promise is to never leave us or never for, forsake us when we walk through difficult things. Unlike the world, we walk with somebody through the difficulties and we have hope of heaven and we have hope of the future and we have hope of a God that is with us, whose Holy Spirit lives in us, that comforts us and helps us through the hard things. So I want us to sing this again to him just with that understanding that he is good. He deserves our worship. He deserves it. He is with us always. He says always until the end of the age. Let's sing this together. You are good. You are good, good. you that you are with us. Your Holy Spirit comforts us, God. I pray that anyone in here that's hurting this morning, that you would just smooth over the rough edges, God, and the, the gaps and the things that, that need healing, God, that you would just touch each person in this room this morning. Be that ever-present help in our time of need. That's your promise. Just thank you for your goodness, God. Thank you for the chance to come together this morning and to worship together. We just pray that you would have your way in the rest of this service, God, that you would just be honored and that your voice would be heard in our hearts this morning with every word spoken. God, we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for coming this morning. If you'd take a moment and meet someone new around you, and then we will continue on with our worship service. Good morning, good morning. How we doing? Wasn't worship amazing? Yes. Well, happy St. Patrick's Day. If you are not wearing green, turn to your neighbor and look at them. You know what to do. Yeah. I have green when I tap my watch. I think that's, that's fair. Anyway. My name is Matt Padilla. I'm the discipleship pastor here. I have a couple of announcements for you. Um, we have a couple of classes that are coming up, and I just want to kind of give you some more understanding of why we do these classes. Um, we have seasons here at Fellowship, and so this season we want to press into um, what does it mean for you and I to understand God's Word. Often we come here and we will sing about the goodness of God, and we will learn about what God is uh, doing for us. But on our personal side, a lot of people struggle with trying to understand God's Word. And so um, those are been some of the most conversations I have. I know that Pastor Eli, Pastor Charlie, Pastor April, like we all get this conversation coming at us. Is how do we get more in step with what the, uh, the Word of God is saying? And so we have two classes for you. The first one is foundation. Uh, this is a class that is, uh, it's based around honest conversations. We understand that people are not always in uh, just this really good spot in their faith, that there's sometimes that whatever life has given to you, it makes you have questions. And so we don't want to ignore those seasons. We want to press into those seasons. And so uh, Foundations helps that. It helps you to ask questions like, who is Jesus? Um, why did he have to die? Who is the Holy Spirit in my life? Uh, these are geared to be able to have roundtable discussion. And so that starts this Wednesday, March 20th at 630. Um, I'm going to encourage you, if you are new to the faith or maybe you just have these questions, uh, please join us for these classes. Now, 
this isn't school. You're not going to get a grade. So even if you can come to 80% of these classes, make an honest effort because there's going to be really, really good conversations within this class. The second class that we have is for a little bit more in-depth understanding of God's Word, and that's how to study the Bible. How is it intricately put together? Most individuals are not really good at ancient literature. It's not just something that they arrive to and say, oh yeah, I understand all of those moving parts. And that's often the case with the Bible. We don't always understand uh, what the history is and why it's saying what it's saying and or maybe how the Old Testament is linked to the New Testament. And so this part one class, we're going to go through the Old Testament. We're going to go um, kind of book by book to show everybody how they can start to understand all of the moving parts of what the Bible has to say. So I would encourage you, whether you're a new believer or you're a seasoned uh, believer, join us for this class because it's going to be instrumental of getting you into that understanding of what God's Word is. And so uh, those are my, my invites for you. That's all this Wednesday, March 20th at 630. Um, I will have some flyers out in the foyer when you leave. Uh, if you see me harassing you and giving you one, uh, just take it. Uh, that, that's all I have to do this weekend is say this and to give those. So just make my day. Don't pinch me. And we're going to have a good time. We're going to continue worshiping with the opening of God's word. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone. You guys doing well today? Oh, good. Well, I'm excited for you. Happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. Man, if I had planned a little bit further in advance, I might have told you a little bit more about St. Patrick because he's awesome. So that's my, uh, just go read his story. You'll really enjoy it. Um, really excited to be teaching for you this weekend. My name is Eli. I'm one of the pastors here at Fellowship of the Rockies. We want to welcome you. Glad to be worshiping alongside you this weekend, opening the word together. We're going to have a good time. If you'd turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. That's where we'll be together. Before I get there, though, I just want to make sure that you're aware that two weeks from today, we will not be here in this building. We will be at Memorial Hall celebrating Easter together in a really special way. We won't have a Saturday night service that weekend, so if you come, we won't, won't be here. So you can. Maybe you spend some alone time with Jesus. That's great. Uh, but there won't be a service that Saturday night. So 9 and 11 a.m. Memorial Hall, two weeks from today. Early Easter this year. Early Easter. But yeah, March 31st. We're looking forward to it. It's a really great time to be together and be out in the community. That's one of the reasons we like uh, having a service off campus uh, during those weekends of uh, Christmas Eve and for Easter. It helps us go and be a part of the community and be really welcoming to the city of Pueblo. The, we love this place. We love this city and we want to be a part of it. And so I want to invite you to that. Uh, I want to help you invite others if that's what you'd like to do. We have these little invite cards that we created for you. They are also at the info desk if you'd like them. So grab one for yourself and grab one for a friend. And uh, that's an easy way to invite people around you. Um, let me begin our time together for the message portion um, by saying if you were to encounter Jesus on the road in northern Galilee when he was walking through his ministry and running around teaching people all over Israel, making the Pharisees real mad at him and the Romans not particularly happy with him, you probably would have heard him talking about the kingdom and you definitely would have heard him telling a story. Jesus is a master storyteller. Is, is the way he weaves words together uh, to make these visuals and images for us to understand his kingdom, it's compelling and it's beautiful and he is remarkably talented at it. We would call these stories parables. They're short, fictional, and they're designed to cut through, to cut through the human experience, to really speak to the heart of an issue or to help us ask better questions or to make us question our own view of this world. But Regardless of what it does for you, the parable is designed to disrupt what you think this life is really all about. And that's what we're going to read in Matthew 13 today is a parable about the kingdom of the heavens. The kingdom of the skies is what Jesus calls this kingdom that he has come to bring to this earth. And he's always trying to help his followers understand this kingdom. And he uses parables to help them visualize and internalize the message that he's brought. Um, but this kingdom in its simplest terms, its simplest definition it's the active rule and reign of God on our earth. It's the active rule and reign of God in this existence that we have. It's the active rule and reign of God is, is him not being a stranger to anyone, us not turning on the street and saying, do you know Jesus? Everyone would know 
God personally and follow his way. That, that's the kingdom that he's come to bring. It's more nuanced than that. There's more to it than that, but that's the starting point for us. It's God's active rule and reign in our day, and these parables help him to help the disciples visualize this and help us to this day visualize this. There's this theologian. His name is Snodgrass. Aren't you glad that that's not what people call you? And he has this to say about the parables. It's a long quote. I've kind of distilled it a little bit. Well, this is what Sno- Mr. Snodgrass says about the parables. He says, The parables are like works of art used as weapons of disruption for the hearers. And there is not a more compelling way to say that. They're works of art. Jesus tells these stories beautifully on purpose. It entices us. It makes us ask questions. It compels us. It, it roots itself in us. I don't know if there's any one or two parables that kind of sit in your mind, and not because you tried to memorize them, but just because you've heard them one or two times and they've stuck with you. Jesus is a master of that art. His parables are works of art. They're used as weapons of disruption. He's not here to destroy anything. He's here to disrupt what we might think this life is actually about. So, Matthew chapter 13. Hands up if you're ready to be disrupted. You don't have to put your hands up. It's okay. But that's what Jesus is about to do. Matthew 13, verse 44, it starts, it says this, The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field. And when a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold all that he had, all that he had, and he bought the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking and searching for fine pearls. And when he found one of great value, he went away, he sold everything he had, and he bought it. Would you pray with me this morning, bow your heads. Lord Jesus, would we have open ears to hear your message open hearts to be transformed by you, and open eyes to see where you're moving in your kingdom now. It's in your holy, precious, and matchless name that we pray. Amen. Can I tell you a story about one of the worst financial decisions I've ever made? We start a time like that. Is it a good way to celebrate our St. Paddy's Day hearing about Eli's bad decisions? First car, first car I ever purchased for myself was a 2002 Volkswagen Jetta. Any Jetta drivers out there? God bless you. You have to buy all these extra tools just to work on your car. It's very frustrating. But I'm telling you about this car because I loved it. It was deeply important to me. It was special to me. It was silver and had this really cool roof rack on it that was designed to hold skis on there. I was way too poor to be skiing at the time that I bought it. So it was just a cool looking roof rack. And this car had kind of like... It had gotten lucky over time. Like, like I had bought some rims for it because I needed to have new ones. And uh, the ones that I ordered were broken. And so the guy I bought them from, he hooked me up with like the nice good ones for the cheap price. And so this car looked like it was worth a lot. It wasn't, okay? But I loved this vehicle. And um, I bought it from a friend. I bought it from a friend of mine. His name is Ryan. He would be in my wedding later on. Don't worry, I did know him outside of buying a car from him. But, but he sold me this car for cheap because he knew that I needed one quickly because I was about to move across the country with my family. I was a senior in high school. It was the middle of my senior year. We were moving to Texas at the time. He knew I needed a vehicle, and so he helped me out. And so he sold me this really cheap car. It was a, it was a, it was a stick. It was a five-speed, and I had to learn how to drive it twice because my dad tried to teach me how to drive stick, thought I had it down, almost killed me and my best friend in the car in Amarillo, and then my best friend who was with me, Logan, he taught me again how to drive a stick. And after that, it kind of clicked. But, but this car, I packed up everything that I had and I moved across the country in it. And then about a year later, I moved from where I was at in Texas back to Pueblo. And that went okay, but it didn't go great enough for me to be able to afford to stay here. And so about eight, eight months later, I moved back to my mom and dad's house in Texas. And then about a year after that, a gentleman by the name of Tom gave me a call from Fellowship of the Rockies. And I ended up moving back to Pueblo four times. And a couple times in between there, when I was moving around in Texas, I packed up everything that I had and needed in the back of this Volkswagen Jetta, okay? That is a simpler time when you can fit everything that you have or need in the back seat and the trunk of a Volkswagen Jetta. Much simpler day. Me and this car have been through some things together deeply valuable to me, formational in my young adult years. I bought it when I was 19, and the clutch went out when I was about 21, okay? I didn't take great care of it. 
sue me. I love this car, though, so if you know where it's at, I would still love to have it. Uh, The clutch went out on it. I did not have enough money to fix it, and so I had to figure something else out. And what I saw, uh, within within a day or so of of the clutch going out and the car kind of rolling to a stop, and I was like, this is not going to move again, is it? No. Okay. And so I, I see this commercial, and it's for one of those vehicle companies that their whole thing is, we'll buy your car no matter what condition it's in, and we'll tow it away for you, we'll take care of it, and we'll pay you money for it. And it's like, if you can imagine like the hopped up radio voice, the guy's like, you could get $1,000 for your car tomorrow type thing. And so 21-year-old Eli is like, I can blow my clutch out and get rich? Like, sign me up. And I'm calling this company immediately. And I'm like, yes, how can I get money for this car that doesn't move? And so... I called this company, they're on my doorstep a, a day later, it was not long, and they're towing it away, I'm saying goodbye to my beloved Jetta, and, uh, and they, they hand me a check, it's 212 bucks. Oh man, first, first problem, that, that is not gonna fix my car problems, like, like I gotta figure something else out. So it was going nowhere as far as helping me get another vehicle, but secondly, Man, I was offended by that. My car is not worth 212 bucks. This, to me, that vehicle, immeasurable value, immeasurable worth. I took it from 110,000, 120,000 maybe-ish miles when I bought it to like 200,000 miles in about 20 months. Okay, I've, I've d- a lot, lived a lot of life in that vehicle in a short amount of time. It was worth so much to me. But that day... It was worth 212 bucks, and it was kind of a take-it-or-leave-it thing, so I, I went ahead and kept the money on that one. But that's the funny thing about value, about what value means and is in our day. The value of something is only what someone will agree to pay for it. So like I said, to me, that little Volkswagen Jetta, immeasurable worth to whatever company that was that towed it away that day, 200 bucks. Something is only the value of what another person will agree to pay for it. Based on the parables we just read, Jesus seems to think that the kingdom of heaven is worth everything you have. All of it. That's the value of the kingdom of the heavens. This parable is interesting because it's not designed to teach us what exactly the kingdom is or how exactly it functions. It's designed to remind us how much is it worth. And it's worth everything. It's worth everything. And this is a theme throughout Jesus' teaching, by the way, the idea of counting the cost. How much will it cost to follow him, to participate in the kingdom? In fact, there's this there's a couple of stories kind of mushed together in Luke chapter 9, and, and it's these stories of people coming to Jesus and asking if they can follow him or they want to follow him down the road and all these things. And you know what's interesting is one of, the, one of the first guys we meet, this guy comes to Jesus, says, uh, Rabbi, I want to follow you. And Jesus doesn't say, yeah, go start prepping dinner with Peter and John over there. No, he stops him and he says, now hold on a second. And he quotes from Isaiah. He says, I don't know where I am going to lay my head tonight. Are you okay with that as my disciple? And the question is, have you counted the cost of following me? Do you know what it's going to cost you to go with me and walk these roads and to become my Talmudi, my disciple? And we're not given a response in the scripture. The idea, operating idea, I guess, is that this guy didn't count the cost. And he's like, yep, I don't think I'm willing to pay that. He doesn't follow Jesus. But the theme throughout Jesus' teaching is what does it cost to follow him? What does it cost in our lives for the kingdom of the skies, for the kingdoms of the heaven? Sorry, for the kingdom of the heavens. This parable is about its value. And what we'll see as we talk this morning is that this isn't a financial statement. This is an orientation of life statement. It's about who we choose to be in this world. So the first point that I have for you this weekend is that the cost of the kingdom is everything. The cost of the kingdom is everything. We find the kingdom when we give up all that we have. In the words of Jesus, anyone who lays down his life for me will find it. It is funny that laying aside things maybe we care about the most, it is in doing that that we take up something worth caring about more than anything else. Life abundant, the life of the kingdom that Jesus has come to bring. See, that's the payment we see from both of the characters in the story. The man who found the treasure in the field goes back, sells all that he has to buy the field. And the man who is the merchant looking for pearls, he goes home and he sells everything he has to buy that pearl of great price. They sell everything to buy their respective treasures. There's this urgency 
there, this reckless abandon that they can't even believe the deal that's before them. Obviously, they will give up everything they have. It says the man about the, the man who's in the field with the hidden treasure, it says in his joy, he goes off and sells everything that he has. There's urgency there. It seems hard to believe for us that there's anything of great enough value buried in a field for us to go sell all that we have to buy that field. But for this man, it was a joy to do that. It was a joy. There's, there's a joy that we experience when we pursue the kingdom of God with reckless abandon and urgency. The kingdom is worth laying aside all that we have. It is worth it. All our money, our assets, our houses, our cars, for me, it's, it's my books in my library, my perceived knowledge. It's worth laying aside those things to follow. Jesus, not because those things are bad things, but because there is something better. There is something better about this world than the material things that we can have in our home or that we can drive on a road. There is more to the human experience and existence than just what you can produce and what you can consume. There is more to that. See, this is what C.S. Lewis has to say about our human condition. He says, It would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink, sex, and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, we are far too easily pleased. If this existence becomes about what you produce and consume, about how much money or possessions that you have, you are far too easily pleased. There is something so much greater offered to us. C.S. Lewis' description of us clinging to our money, our houses, cars, phones, stuff, it's very simple. It's like playing in the dirt. It's like making mud pies when there's an offer of a holiday at the sea. There is something better available to us. And just as an aside, This is kind of what bothers me probably the most about most TV preachers that I've seen and heard. Um, There's this movement, most of them are on TV, but some of them aren't, uh, of of what we would call the prosperity gospel. The word gospel has been kind of tagged into that movement. It's really not a gospel at all. Um, But here's here's what the prosperity gospel movement will tell you. Um, And I'll also throw this out there. A lot of people like to accuse people all the time of being in the prosperity gospel movement. Just relax with that. I'm I'm talking about people who will legitimately stand on a stage and say, if you sow a seed, if you give me your money, if you give my church your money, God's going to multiply it all to you. The saddest part of that lie, and it is a lie, is not that it promises you too much, it's that it promises you too little. There's so much more. There's so much more to this world than mud pies playing in the dirt with our cash. There's so much more to this world than that. There's eternal joy offered to us in the kingdom of Jesus. It's not some ethereal post-death moment. It is something that is invading our earth now through the person and work of Jesus and his body, the church right now in this place. There's eternal joy offered to you, and it's offered to me. There's a holiday at sea. For C.S. Lewis, he's like an Englishman, so a holiday at sea for him is like, it's still cold, rainy, and windy, but there's sand. I'm t- when I talk about a holiday at the sea, I'm talking like Zach Brown Band, Florida, yeah, Florida Georgia Line. This is the first amen I've gotten today. That's cool. Florida Georgia Line. I'm talking beach in Florida. It's hot outside. Sand is warm. The surf is cold, and you are walking the beach. There's something about that moment that makes tension the things of the world fade away, but it's not just like forgetting, for, forgetting things that are difficult. It's, it's being reminded of what's most important. That's what happens in that moment. What's most important to us? There's an eternal joy offered to you. This is how Paul describes it. In Philippians chapter 3, we actually read this passage a couple weeks ago with Pastor Charlie, who's been doing an awesome series through Philippians. If you haven't watched it, you can online if you'd like to. Philippians chapter 3, Paul is talking about all the things of status that he has in his life. He's, he's talking about being a Jew of Jews and, and a, um, a Pharisee of Pharisees and how he was a Jew born of the tribe of Benjamin and how he was circumcised on the eighth day and all these things that are supposed to, for him, give him a lot of social status and, and power and influence. And this is what he has to say about it. Philippians 3, I'll start in verse 7. He said, whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss. 
for the sake of Jesus. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. This is the operating idea here. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. I consider them garbage. All the things of social status and power and influence is garbage. And the NIV is really polite with their translation of that Greek word there when it says garbage. KJV gets a little closer when it says dung. But the Greek word is skubalon. And I know that you did not walk into this room this morning, 10.30 a.m., March 17th, thinking you were going to learn the Greek word for poop. <laughs> but here we are, skubalon. That's the Greek word for excrement or for refuse, mostly from animals. Do I need to put that together for you? Paul says it's, it's dog poop to me. All of that, is, it's worthless because there's something so much greater offered. That's not to say that the existence that we don't live in isn't full of beauty and good things. Of course it is. It's not, these things aren't said because wealth or money is a, is a bad thing, but there is an infin- infinitely greater thing offered to us the kingdom of the skies, the kingdom of the heavens. These two parables, they work in tandem to ask the simplest question, what do we value the most? What do we value the most? And it's not supposed to be guilt-inducing or obligation-inducing questions. I think Jesus really wants us to consider, do you really know the joy I'm offering you? Do you really know the abundant life that the kingdom offers you? One of the greatest dangers of our day is that we don't actually stop or pause long enough to actually ask that question. That we never actually stop to consider, do I know the joy of the kingdom of heaven and that is offered to me? Jesus describes his kingdom in this passage not as crown jewels on display for people to come and see, but like a treasure that's hidden in a field. And I think what this implies is that many people will pass by without ever knowing that they're missing something of great value. Their life moves too fast. They will never search the field. The second point for you this weekend is finding the kingdom, it means slowing down. It means slowing our lives down and simplifying. And this is a word for our day. If we give ourselves over to the world and the culture that we live in, we will miss the kingdom lying in a field because we are addicted to hurry. We are addicted to accomplishing things one right after the next. We are addicted to filling our calendars. We never slow down. Do we ever slow down? I don't want to project this on you, but do we ever slow down enough to consider the question of the kingdom? Everything about our world is how quickly we can get something done. How can we do it spending the least amount of energy? How can we do it at the lowest cost? I learned about this triangle in college, and it was the the cost-time-quality matrix and how those are like the three factors of any good product or service that you could provide for somebody. And so, so like you have cost, time, and quality, and you can only ever accomplish two of those things at one time. Like, if you want something to be high quality, um, but you want it to be low cost, it's going to take a lot of time. It's not going to be convenient. But if you want something that is um, uh, short on time, convenient on time, and low on cost, the quality is going to go way down. If you need an example, the American church's discipleship. And then if you you were to try to have something that you wanted to be high in quality, but convenient on time, it's going to cost you a lot of money. The world functions by that matrix in so many ways. It's pernicious, it's everywhere. It's pervasive all through our culture. That's how the world operates with the question in mind, how can I maximize everything I I have? How can I 10X my life? How can I maximize all that I have? Which isn't an evil goal, but it is an all-consuming one. We'll consume all of what we do and have and are. It's a goal that leads people all the time to bend the rules of morality, 
to bend the rules of ethics, to bend the rules in a way subject to our own wants and desires in a way that we would begin to manipulate other people for our own agenda, to try to control other images of God. We live in a world that values efficiency over integrity. That is not the way of Jesus. It's not the way of Jesus. And we have to stop functioning this way, especially if we want to find the kingdom of God, because if we function this way, everything is about maximizing our results. We'll never stop and look at the field. We'll never start to dig. Part of the image of this parable is to open our eyes and look around us in the field we're in for the kingdom of God and not just leave it behind. We can't be so consumed with our own productivity that we never experience the peace of the kingdom. We're in danger of moving so fast that we never grab a shovel, that we never check the field for the treasure that is hidden, that is worth everything we have. It's eternal joy. So if I can make this as direct as possible, let me just ask, are you moving at a pace too fast to experience the kingdom of Jesus? Are you moving at a pace so fast that you cannot see what the kingdom of God is, how it's functioning around you? What if God wants to bless you in that difficult job that you have, but all you can ever dream of is escaping it? Moving too fast through life. Maybe it's in your relationships and you just bounce from one person to the next thinking that they are going to meet some perceived need that you have at the time, but you are never slow enough, quiet enough, calm enough, content enough in a relationship, patient enough to see how you're functioning as the kingdom of God in that person's life or how they're going to function that way in yours. Are we moving too fast? Dallas Willard, he's a theologian, he famously said, hurry is the great enemy of the spiritual life and you must ruthlessly eliminate it. You must ruthlessly eliminate it from your life. I hear it all the time from parents and grandparents that they wish they had just enjoyed the kids being young when they were. I wish I, wish I could just go back to when they were four. They're only four once. They're only five once. I've never heard an older person say, man, I wish that I had spent more time at the office when I was your age. Never heard that. Not once. In fact, I was on a ski lift in Monarch just a couple of weeks ago with a man who is older than I am and perhaps old enough to be seen as wise. So is he old? I don't know. You tell me. I was riding up the lift with him and I thought maybe I would ask him for some wisdom we're having a conversation. We have a relationship. We know each other a bit. And so I'm like, man, what's the kind of wisdom that you'd give to like a mid-20s kid trying to figure it all out? You know, that kind of thing. And um, he didn't disregard my question by any stretch, but he knows me. He's like, you know, it's like, I think I can speak kind of personally in your life. And I was like, yes, please do type thing. And he, he said, there will always be ministry. There will always be projects to do. There will always be work. But you will not always be a young married man. And so his advice to me was stop riding up the lift with him and go ride the lift with my wife who is there with us. <laughs> and second amens. There we go. And, uh, and it worked. It made me really think, am I moving too fast? Am I moving too fast to experience the blessing of what it's like to be a young married man with no kids? I know so many of you just like nodded like, yes, you are. You are so taking that for granted. I know that that's what you're saying. I'm just bringing you on the journey with me, okay? And here's the thing. I know that this kind of sounds like adding another thing to life. is like, okay, well, I have to start searching for the kingdom now. I've got three kids. I'm a mom. I, you know, like I've got soccer practice and basketball practice and a parent-teacher conference, and I can't be in two places at once, much less three places at once, and now you want me to also be searching for the kingdom of the skies somewhere? I was thinking about that as I was writing this, and, and I think that mistakes some of what Jesus is saying. Because this is not about adding something to your life. It is about reorienting our lives, and that's the third point for you this weekend. This is, finding the kingdom is not adding something to our lives. It's reorienting them around what is most important. It's reorienting them. It's whatever field you're in right now, where, where's the treasure buried? Pick up a shovel. Here's the thing. It's not adding. Everyone is already searching. 
We are already searching. We are already finding things to put our faith, our hope, our trust in. We're already f- looking for things to place our joy in, things to help us make it through this life in this world. And I just think sometimes we use the wrong things, and that's what the parable of the searching merchant envisions for us. The text tells us that he is searching. He's already searching for good, nice pearls when he finds the one of great value, of great price. This implies that there are other pearls for sale. The kingdom of God is not the only thing for sale that claims it will give you eternal joy. Our world, this culture that we live in, there are things that our world pushes us to believe are the precious pearls that will give us fulfillment and that won't cost us an arm and a leg. They're the pearls of a good deal, not the pearls of great price. Things like money and sex and power, the things that we're told are the most precious parts of our existence, that we could we could orient our lives around them if we wanted to. We could orient our lives around control. We could orient our lives around influence if we wanted to. We have that choice. Those are pearls that are for sale that we can probably afford from time to time. We have a choice, but we have to know that there is a cost to that as well. Preachers preach all the time. I preached earlier in this sermon. Do we know what it costs to follow Jesus? Have we counted the cost of following him? Do we know the cost of discipleship? That's a Dietrich Bonhoeffer book that you should read if you haven't. It's a beefcake, though. It's awesome. Do we know the cost of following Jesus? But there is also the inverse of that is do we understand the cost of not following him? What's the cost of of not taking the pearl of great price, of holding on to the pearls that we want instead? Dallas Willard talks about this a lot in a book called The Great Omission, and he he talks about the cost of non-discipleship, cost of non-discipleship. Now, he's obviously talking about spiritual formation, some very specific things, but I think this does expand to talk about the kingdom in our day. This is what he says. In short, non-discipleship costs you exactly that abundance of life that Jesus said he came to bring. It costs you the life that Jesus calls truly life. He says, the cross-shaped yoke of Christ is, after all, an instrument of liberation and power to those who live in it with him and learn the meekness and lowliness of heart that brings rest to the soul. They don't make writers like that anymore. It costs us everything. The pearls of a good deal. (laughs) They cost us that life of abundance that Jesus actually wants us to have. We lose a life full of love and joy and peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit are not just a goal that we have in our spiritual life. It is part of the human experience that Jesus calls abundance. When we experience love and gentleness and share our love and gentleness, we give up on that life. We give up on that when we don't commit ourselves to the kingdom of Jesus. We lose that peace that surpasses human understanding. I don't know if you've noticed, and it's interesting how this works, that the more we try to orient our lives around happiness, the more it can begin to elude us. Or the more we begin to orient our lives around control, the more we can just feel it slipping from our fingers. Or the more we orient our lives around certainty, the less we feel sure about ourselves. Don't settle for mud pies, my friends. Not clinging to that pearl of great price, it costs us a life of slavery to sin, slavery to our own desires. It costs us our freedom. When we don't search for the treasure and we cling to the other pearls, it costs us a life of love, a faith that guides, inspires, and motivates a hope that stands firm in hard times, the power to do what is right in the face of evil. The simple question is, what is it costing you? What is it costing you not to follow Jesus? What is it costing you not to give everything for that pearl of great price? Maybe you came into this room and you're like, yeah, Eli, I believe in Jesus, I get it. It's like, great, that's good. 
this isn't just about faith. It's about what are we orienting our lives around? What is most valuable to you? And what is that costing you? So as we have come to a close today, there's one last reflection that I want to share with you from many voices throughout history. I'm far from the wisest person to interpret these parables. Many have throughout time. And many interpret these two parables of the treasure hidden in a field and of the pearls of great price to actually be Jesus describing his own mission in the world. That you and I are the treasure hidden in a field that God goes and sells everything he has, his one and only son, to buy us. That you and I are the pearls of great price. That in his joy, Jesus gives all that he has for his life, all of it. In his joy, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. And that, my friends, is the gospel that we remember as we come to the bread and to the cup. You have elements that are sitting before you, a seat back in front of you, or if you're on the front, they're on your sides. And, and as we come to communion, um, we believe that believers and followers of Jesus should take communion. And so if that's not you this morning, there's no need to participate. And not because you're left out, but why would you? (laughs) When we come to the bread and the cup, we proclaim that we believe in the promises of Jesus. We believe that the kingdom is worth everything that we have. That's what we're saying when we come to the bread and the cup. That we believe and receive the gospel that is Jesus died for us to wipe us clean of our sins and to release us into the world as his new creation, transformed into his image by his spirit to see the kingdom meet earth, to see heaven and earth be reunited, to see the redemption of all things. And that's what we remember as we come to the bread that it was said on the night that he was betrayed. He took the bread from the table at this family dinner that he was at and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. We pray over the bread. Lord Jesus, we remember now your body that's broken for us and the beautiful, sweet grace and mercy that is released in its brokenness. We love you and we trust you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Take and eat. It says also that he took the cup of wine from the table. He said, this is the new covenant made in my blood. And Hebrews tells us that this covenant is a better covenant made on better promises from God himself. We also look forward in the cup because Jesus says he will drink it again alongside us in the new creation in the new creation at the wedding supper of the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world. That's what we look to in the cup. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, we believe your promises. Would you send your spirit that we might see your kingdom come here? It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you take the cup with me? We believe that communion, that the Lord's Supper is a response to the goodness of the Lord. It's how we remind ourselves of the gospel and and how we relive parts of Jesus' journey. Ground is equal at the foot of the cross. We all come before the cross the same. Sinners in need of a savior a Savior who loves us and has proven his love for us. We're going to respond in one other way this morning is through prayer. And so in a moment, I'll pray for us, and then we'll stand, and then I'll invite the prayer partners to make their way forward, and that'll be an opportunity for you. If you need personal and private prayer in this time, this will be your opportunity where you can pray over whatever it is that's going on in your life with our prayer partners. Uh, Maybe today uh, you have come to know that there's a pearl of great price and you're ready to pay. You're ready to give everything to orient your life around Jesus. We want to walk you through that and pray with you for that. Um, it could be, it could have nothing to do with anything I said today. That's okay too. If you need, uh, if you're having a financial struggle or, or a familial relational struggle, we want to pray with you and pray for you. And so you'll take that opportunity in just a moment. But for now, would you just bow your heads and close your eyes? And I wonder if we might pause for a second, maybe take a deep breath. In through your nose, you know the drill. Out through your mouth. Be calm for a moment. Ask the question, are you moving at a pace so fast 
that you cannot experience the kingdom of Jesus, the one that he came to bring? Is your pace so fast that you have no idea the treasure that's in the field around you? Have you clung to the pearls of a decent deal, the mud pies? <laughs> Have you clung to those things to give you certainty or to help you function? And you know it's time to sell what you got, take up the pearl of great price. Lord Jesus, we love and we trust you. We thank you for your blood that was spilled for us, for your body that was broken for us. We praise you for that. We thank you that you did not stay dead, but that there was life that flowed back through your veins and your limbs. You resurrected and you sent it to the right hand of the Father to be our advocate and to send your spirit to us. Lord, would you send us your spirit that we might see your kingdom come here in Pueblo as it is in heaven. It is in your holy, precious, and matchless name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? I'd like to invite the prayer partners to make their way towards the front of the room. Just make your way down. Thank you very much. And right now, if you need to pray over anything that's going on in your life. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. Like I mentioned before, it could have nothing to do with anything I said. Um, whatever the Lord is putting on your heart, we want to pray with you, alongside you, and for you. And so you don't hesitate. You just make your way forward and respond to how Jesus is moving in your life. I promise people will, will let you out of the aisles. They don't bite. They're really nice. take as long as we need to. So if you need to respond in prayer, we will be right here at the front praying. And so you just uh, take the opportunity as, as you need prayer. For the rest of us, if you'd like to connect with us here at the church, there are a couple ways that you can do that. There's a connect card in the seat back in front of you. That's the blue card. I think it's the largest of the cards that's in the seat back. And so if, you, if you'd like to connect with us, you can fill that out, drop it in the box in the back of the room, or you can do it digitally if you'd like to. You just scan that QR code and it'll come straight to the pastors. Um, maybe you're interested in becoming saved. Maybe you're interested in baptism. Whatever it is uh, that you'd like to connect with us about, we'd love to talk with you and, and hear from you and, and talk a bit. So that's a great way to connect with us um, for the rest of us. Let me just read a benediction for us this morning. If you wouldn't mind, um, this may be uncomfortable for you. That's okay. I just ask that you lift your hands like this and let's receive the word of the Lord this morning. It's a blessing out of Numbers chapter 6. This is what it says. Numbers chapter 6. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you. May he give you his peace. God's grace and peace be multiplied to you. God bless you. You have a good week. You are dismissed.